I hope you have. You don't go to war by, <clears throat> without a weapon. And the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty to God to the pulling down of strongholds. If you have your Bibles, turn 1 Corinthians chapter number, make it 1 Peter chapter number 5, if you'd like to stand with me this morning. 1 Peter chapter number 5. And verse number 8. 1 Peter chapter 5. And verse number 8, the Apostle Peter, speaking on very practical terms, says, 1 Peter 5, 8, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, note under word that, underline that word, adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Now watch carefully. Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Father, bless the book. In thy name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Should give reverence to the Word of God because it is the Word of God. There are people who stake their life on the advice of a financial advisor or upon the counsel of a doctor or upon the uh, word of a professor. But my friend, all of these are fallible people. But when God's Word speaks, Take it for what it is. It is the word of the infallible one, of the eternal one. That is truth with no admixture of error. When it talks about the devil, it doesn't speak about the devil in superstitious terms. The word of God nowhere ever refers to every rock you turn over as being the cover of a demon. The scripture tells you nowhere to be hunting and trying to find that which is evil. It nowhere places a man as an exorcist or as some kind of a spiritual champion that's fighting evil. But what we do, we are placed in, according to the scripture, to discern evil. To be able to know the difference between right and wrong. To know the difference between truth and error. This world is full of deception. As a matter of fact, I've never in my lifetime, which has been very short, known of a time of more deception. And the horrible thing about deception is the fact that once the individual is deceived, they do not know it. And so therefore you must awaken them, or you must be able to shine the light into their darkness, or you must be able to get their attention. Somehow or another you must be able to reach them for they will never find their own way out of deception because they don't even know they're deceived. So they have no reason to try to find their way out of it. But by the power of the Holy Spirit who guides into all truth, who leads us from darkness into light, who shines forth the glory of the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ, who shows us who he truly is, that he is victor over death, hell, and the grave. That he is the resurrected anointed one. That the apostle Peter wanted you to understand. That in this world that when you suffer affliction. That you're suffering the same thing that the children of this world suffer. And that this affliction is not some strange thing that should come upon you. In the first chapter of 1 Peter the apostle Peter was talking to people. Who were suffering at the hands of Nero. The mad fool that burned Rome to the ground and fiddled, they say, while it burned. And then he blamed it on the Jews and the Christians. He had a reason for what he did. And so, my friend, what you're reading here in the book of 1 Peter, probably in all the Bible, is one of the greatest books about suffering in this world and about why we suffer and the purpose of it. But the apostle warns you that we have an adversary that uses that. And so therefore we're not ignorant of his devices. We need to understand that if you try to match the devil with your intellect, you've already lost. 
If you try to match Satan with your experience, he's way ahead of you. If you try to match Satan with any contrived thing that human beings try to use, you're going to lose. And so therefore your only true weapon against the devil is the truth. And the Bible said you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. And so therefore he said sanctify them through that truth. Thy word is truth. So the book I have in my hand this morning is going to tell me what I should, uh, what I should, uh, what I should scurn, what I should get away from, and the course that I should walk, and how I should live. And so my friend, this morning I'm going to preach you a method, a, me a message about the methods of deception that Satan uses. For he is an adversary, and he is going about seeking whom he may devour. And you may feel in this house today that he's pretty well sifted you. And you, may be, and you may feel like that he has begun to devour you. And you may feel like that you're in a losing side. And that you have no real weapon against Satan, but you do. But you really do. Because one of his greatest deception is his bluster. Is his boasting. Is his arrogance. Is his bragging. He has to do it. Because he's the father of pride. He's the father of all the children of pride. It's got to come out of him. He's got to let you know how great he is. And so that's one of his greatest downfalls. So my friend, when we look at the methods of deception, in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 33, here's the first one. And what is that preacher? Wrong crowd. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. I would choose who I go with very carefully. I'd make certain that that boy that I'm dating or that girl that I'm dating, my friend is not out here smoking dope and shooting pills and taking methamphetamines and running with a bunch of kooks. I'd be very careful. You say, well, I'll convert them. No, they'll convert you. And when you run with the wrong crowd, it's going to rub off on you. You can't wallow with hogs without smelling like one. And you can't run with them without talking like one. And it will drag you down. You must separate yourself from them, especially in this culture today. The second thing my friend Satan uses for deception is the wrong wisdom. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 3 and verse 18, the Bible says, Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool, that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness, and again the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. So all of the rational wisdom that the world has to dish up and oh, how they want to counsel you. And they want to tell you what the meaning of life is. They want to tell you how that you ought to set your life and how you ought to understand things. How you should accept this and reject that. Oh, they are full of counselors. And the Bible says that they're vain. The scripture says, oh, vain man. Their counsel is the counsel of hell that leads to destruction. I know that I look like a fool in the eyes of the world. I'm not out here to win their approval. I'm not seeking their recognition. And if they give it to me, I'll throw it away. I never want you to know that I'd sunk to such a low level. If the world ever starts talking good about me, I'm in bad shape. You can be certain of that. I am an enemy of the devil. I am on one side and he's on the other. And according to the scripture, if you don't think according to the word of God, you're a fool. And your thoughts are vain. Oh, vain man. And I'll tell you today, they are pumping it into you through that filthy tube you've got in your house. Or through the radio or through the school systems, the educational establishment. Through the, through the social interactivity at work, through everything that you come in contact day in and day out, they are feeding you one lie after another. It is all designed to tear down the truth of the Word of God in your life. If you live after the flesh, which is the wisdom of this world, you will die. But if you through the Spirit mortify the deeds of the flesh, 
Renew your mind, ye shall live. Third thing he uses is the wrong attitude. In 1 John chapter number 1 and verse number 8, the Bible said, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Let me show you the perspectives you can have on that very scripture. Perspective number one. It's only talking about somebody that has committed a sin, preacher. And 1 John 1 is there so we can bring them to the text and get them right with God. Wrong. Perspective number two. Well, preacher, I know that's scriptures in speaking in general terms. And we're all sinners. And so, I mean, really, you don't really take it personally, do you? Wrong. Perspective number three. That scripture is talking about your real nature. It's talking about what's going on inside the depth of your heart. Even if you can't even conceive it, perceive it, or understand who and what you are. That the light of the word of God is constantly shining itself on your soul. And if you let God's word shine on your soul and the Holy Ghost do his work, he will be working constantly in you through confession that you're walking closer and closer to the Lord and producing sanctification in your life. You say, preacher, I don't have a problem. I don't need that. That's because your discernment is wrong. You never arrive at a time of sinless perfection in this life. I don't care who told you they're sinless. I don't care who told you they do not sin. You never arrive at a time of sinless perfection. Let me qualify my statement. I am not telling you that it's okay to just go out and sin as you please. The Bible said, how that we are dead to sin continue anymore therein? Should I make the grace of God a license to sin? No. But what I am telling you is that what you may not perceive as sin today, that you may, as far as you understand, have confessed everything in your life, that there is nothing between you and the Lord, that's good. But as long as you are in this body of death, it will affect your life and Satan will affect your walk with God. And if you've got the spiritual discernment that the Holy Ghost is talking about here, when it rises in your soul, you confess it immediately and the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses it and your fellowship is unbroken and you continue to walk in communion with the Lord and you, can sin, and you confess to God, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? That's what he's talking about. I hope you understood me. I hope you understood me. I hope you understand that you're not perfect, but that if you will confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness, and that fellowship won't be broken. But when you refuse to confess what the Holy Ghost is leading you to in your heart, raising you up in your soul, for sins take on a much subtler meaning. They take on a much more, they take on a much higher spiritual tone. As you have confessed all of your fleshly sins, as you've been forgiven for all of the fleshly garbage, the kind of stuff that they wallow in, in the world, that doesn't bother you anymore. Hallelujah. Thank God. That stuff is gone. You know the lust of the flesh. You're talking about the sins of the youth. You know what I'm talking about. And now, thank God, you've got victory over that good. But you see, our enemy, the devil, is a great tactician. He changes his strategy. As you begin to walk closer and nearer and higher with God, it is no longer the sins of the flesh that you're tempted with sometime. Now he's talking about the sins of pride, the sins that speak into the soul, the sins that you begin to realize that were in there that you didn't even know resided. Listen, the most deceptive thing on this earth. Do you know what it is? Do you know what the most deceptive thing on the face of the earth is? Here's what the Bible said. The heart is deceitful above all things. 
Who can know it? Are you wise? Are you spiritually discerning today enough to say, Lord God, I think I know, but there may be things in my heart I don't even know about. There may be places in there you're going to put your hand. And Lord, if you do put your hand, give me the grace of God to confess it before it becomes a root of bitterness, before it begins to fester and I pet that I won't confess and it becomes a stronghold of Satan. And listen, folks, everybody doesn't have a stronghold. But once Satan gets a stronghold in your life, he dominates your life. And he won't turn it loose. He's got to be driven out. And you understand what I'm saying? Some of you don't need to be around certain places. Some of you don't need to be around certain people. There are some things you just don't need to touch. Some of you have weaknesses others don't. And so confess them to God and walk in the light as he is in the light. And you'll have fellowship one with another. And you'll say, Lord, you showed me. God, forgive me. Cleanse me. Give me the grace of God to overcome it. And I want to love you and walk with you. I want you to live in me and give me strength. And God will do it. Amen. And your fellowship won't be broken. And here's the fourth thing. My friend, that is a method of deception. What's that, preacher? Wrong practice. James chapter number 1 and verse 22 said, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Some of you think just because you come to church, and come to church and hear the word of God, that for somehow or another that's just going to make a change in your life, and everything's going to be hunky-dory. But the truth of the matter is it'll only harden you if it doesn't soften you. Because one way or the other, you're either going to receive it or you're going to reject it. And if you don't live by what you profess to believe, it's going to manifest itself like you wouldn't believe. And I'm going to tell you the truth. There'll come a time in your life when you get sick of your own hypocrisy. Amen. Amen. You'll look in the mirror and say, Lord God, what have I become? That's right. You've judged everybody under the sun for doing the same thing you're doing. Don't just listen to the word. Let it work on your heart. Say, Lord God, is that really what I am? Yeah. Lord God, do I really need that? Yeah. Lord God, do you really understand me better than I understand me? Hey, hey, amen. Yes, he does. How many of you believe the Lord's smarter than you are? Raise your hand. Sometimes you just got to get plain and practical with people. Some of you are real arrogant in your rebellion against God. Somehow or another you feel like because you got it covered up and never talk about it, you won't think on it, but it still dominates your life. That somehow or another it doesn't exist, but it's real, friend. It exists. It's real. And it's a mark between you and the Lord. Number five, a wrong self-image is a method of deception. Romans chapter number 12 and verse 3, the Bible said, For I say, through the grace given to me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Listen, for if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. I'm going to make everybody in the house mad right now. You ain't nothing. So you ought to use ain't. You know what ain't means. That's the problem. You can use a whole lot of words. Folks don't understand. They understand they ain't. <laughs> and we're nothing. Well, you're not going to talk to me like that. That's because your pride directs you. And you follow your pride. Feed off, feast off your pride. Oh, how you love to be bragged on. How great you are when you walk in a room. You're the most beautiful thing ever walked the face of the earth. And you're the smartest thing that ever lived. Now come down off your high horse. You're nothing. And the Apostle Paul summed it up real good. Here's what he said. He said, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. I am what I am by the grace of God. Amen. I have to say that this morning. If, it were, if I were left to my own devices, I'd be in hell right now. I'd been screaming now for decades probably. I'd been in hell back in the 70s. At most the 80s. I've been in hell now for probably 30 years. I've been down there screaming in hell for the last 30 years. But thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. 
thankful thanks be unto God for the light that shineth in darkness thank God for the voice that awakened to me my lost condition and God who is rich in mercy where his great love where he loved us while I was yet a sinner Christ died for me hearing his love not that I loved him but that he loved me first and gave himself for me amen I'm nothing never have been anything never will be anything but by the grace of God but he reached down into the pit and took this old boy and said son for a while in this world you'll see a little bit of what I've got in store for you but wait till you see eternity amen and that's what he has for all of us well now preacher what about these guys that brag about all that they've done and all the greatness they are and everybody swoons or she or he when they get in their presence they are eaten up with their own ego and self-image and self-love. Nowhere in the Bible does it command you to love yourself. Find it for me, and I'll sit down with you for a good hour, and we'll just look at each other and talk and pray. If you can show me in that Bible, I'm challenging you, show me one single passage that commands you to love yourself. Every time the scripture refers to a man who loves himself, it's an observation. There's a vast difference between, means for, between me saying, you love yourself. That doesn't mean I approve it. That means I observed it. There's a vast difference between that and me saying to you, you need to love yourself. You see the line the preacher crossed? Do you see what's happened? and you fill a church full of people that love themselves, you're in for destruction. You fill a marriage full of two people that love themselves more than they love each other, and you've got a recipe for destruction. You find anybody that's in love with themselves, my friend, and I'll show you somebody that's got a problem walking with the Lord Jesus Christ. Nowhere in the Bible does it command you to love yourself. I put that challenge out a long time ago. I have yet to hear my phone ring one time. I have yet to get the first email. I have yet to get the first reference, the first response from anybody. Do you know why? It's not in there. It doesn't exist. It's psycho babble. It's not the word of God. Wrong harvest. Galatians chapter number six and verse number seven says, be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. I didn't say that. God said that. You just thought the church was a good place of feel good and you could just live any way you wanted to and do anything you pleased. And, and God's just this big old kiss old man up in heaven that's just going to throw his arms around all of you and welcome you home to heaven when you die. But I'm sorry, you're not going to mock him. If you sow to the flesh, you'll of the flesh reap corruption. You will reap what you sow. Well, what about you, preacher? Same here. God's no respecter of persons when it comes to this. You'll reap what you sow. You say those are rough words, preacher, but they're true. You're not going to mock God. You're not going to mock Him. You're deceived if you think you can live any way you please and go to heaven. And a man is a bold-faced liar that says that this preacher tells you you can get saved, once saved, always saved, and live any way you want to and go to heaven. You're a liar. I don't believe it. I believe that once you are born again by the grace of God, you belong to the Lord Jesus Christ and that if you try to live any way you please, he will chasten you and he'll deal with you as with a son. And if you don't let him deal with you as a son, he'll turn you over to the devil, 1 Corinthians 5. And goodbye, you'll have no time left in this world. And that's who John was talking about in 1 John 5 when he said, I see a brother sinning a sin unto death. Dear Christian friend, don't sit back on your eternal security and think because you mumbled some sinner's prayer 30 years ago, that the, your life is in your hands to live any way you please. No sirree, it's not. He's the Lord. He's either going to be the Lord of your life or you're not going to live once you become a son of God. I'm going to say it one more time. He's the Lord, which means master owner. Why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? 
He's the Lord. He'll either be the Lord of your life or he'll take your life away. That's eternal security. <laughs> because he says he will take you lest you be condemned with this world. Amen. Finally, methods of deception, wrong future. 1 Corinthians chapter number 6 and verse 9, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind shall inherit the kingdom of God. Somebody told me that yesterday they had that Knoxville, who has its own Mardi Gras now, don't know who started that, but they, have, they, had, a, they, had, a, they had a sodomite parade down Gay Street yesterday. Is that correct? And that our illustrious mayor was the, what do you call it, whatever. She was the grand marshal, but the mayor was there, showing approval by being present. All right. Now, I'm going to close with this this morning. You're either going to accept the pronouncements of a pervert generation that has turned its back on the truth. Now, listen, listen, listen. If you don't believe this Bible, okay? You don't believe the Bible, all right? Let's say it. Forget the Bible. It's gone. All right. Now, you don't believe the Bible, okay? So you say, I'm a sodomite, all right? Up in Washington, D.C. in the White House a couple of days ago, uh, the illustrious president had a bunch of uh, gay activists, they called themselves in, and they got into the room where a portrait of Ronald Reagan, Ronald Reagan was hanging on the wall. They went into the room where Ronald Reagan was, was a portrait of, 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 of President Reagan. They started shooting birds. They photographed it, and it went, it went everywhere. I saw it on Drudge. They're in here throwing birds at Ronald Reagan. I doubt if they'd throw one at Bill Clinton. And I know they wouldn't throw a bird at uh, Barack Obama. But they were throwing birds at Ronald Reagan. Now I wonder why. Now. You say, well, what's wrong with sodomy? All right. Vladimir Putin, who is the president of Russia, if you ever take the opportunity and take the time to just do a little reading, you'd find out that if you were a sodomite in Russia, Bible, irregardless of the Bible, you'd be under more persecution and scrutiny than you ever imagined existed on this earth. A few other countries, if you were a sodomite in that country, they'd take you out and hang you from a pole. Most Muslim countries that live under Sharia law, they wouldn't let you live five minutes if you were a sodomite. Now, who's right? Are the Russians right or are the Saudi Arabians right or, or, or is the pervert generation in America right? See, who, who? It's all relative unless you believe the Bible. Now, 1964, when I graduated from rural high school, I know we probably had, had uh, I, hate, I don't like the word gay, had sodomites in our school, and I know that we probably did. We didn't know who they were because they, 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 they kept undercover. <laughs> so they didn't, they, didn't, they, didn't, they didn't let people know who they were. Why? Because if you're not my age, you can't imagine the America that I lived in 1964. You can't imagine. You can't imagine the America I lived in in 1964. You can't. You can't. You can't do it. Because back then, it was a pariah. It was a pervert. It was a filthy, filthy sexual abomination. That's what it was. Of course it is. According to the Bible, it is. But... I'm just trying to show you how that cultures change, countries change, times change. So what am I going to be 25 years ago? If I live to be 175, Abraham's age, <laughs> what's it going to be then? What do you think it's leading to? What's next? The North American Man-Boy Love Association, NAMBLA. You know what they're pushing for, don't you? You know this coach up here at Penn State that just had 45 counts of child sexual abuse charged against him and he was found guilty? 
Apparently, he's going off to prison the rest of his life. But now look, there is an organization in this country that is pushing for that very thing to be legalized. I mean, if anything goes, if you're wide open, you've got an open mind, blah, blah, blah. Where does that lead? What's next? What's next? What's next? What's next? The only thing that keeps you from becoming a stinking animal, wallowing just like a hog, is that book right there. That book. That book. That book. The book. The Biblios. The book. The culture of 1964, the United States of America, was pretty close to the book. The culture of 2012, the United States of America, is far from the book. So where am I supposed to go? Am I just going to fly this way and fly that way? I'm this today, I'm that tomorrow. What are you? Are you like that? Are you this today and that tomorrow? You don't have a head. Whatever's pumped into it, whatever just fed, spoon fed to you day in and day out, is that what you are? Or do you have a book you believe? Which one is it? Which one is it? Which one is it? Father, in Jesus' name, use what I've said this morning. It's time, Holy One, that thy people took courage in what they believe and what they are and that they stand for the truth and not for every wind and doctrine and not for some perverted, mis misguided understanding of the word love, but for the truth. In Jesus' name we pray. There may be somebody in this house this morning, Lord, that they've fallen prey, Lord. Satan's working them over. He's sifting them. And they don't even think there's a place of forgiveness for them. But, Lord, there is. There may be some in this house today is beginning to wake up, God. They're right now starting to really wake up and realize how much they've been brainwashed by this pervert culture. And they're beginning to rejoice in the truth. In thy name we pray. There may be somebody in this house this morning, Lord, that is completely, totally lost. But the light is starting to shine. God grant that they'll watch it, listen to it, and follow it. In thy name we pray. Amen. Stand up and sing this morning, brother. Lord of God. Page 333 in your All-American <laughs> Church Hymn. Chicago. Folks, your grandmother and grandfather weren't wrong. They were right. Your mothers and fathers back in the 50s and the 60s weren't wrong. They were right. Let's sing another verse. Timer said it rang it rings clear like a bell. Truth does. It does. It rings clear. It rings clear. It just it just shakes off all of the ambiguity. It just kind of shakes off all of the uncertainty and, and it just rings clear. It just stands out there in front of you. And that's the truth. The truth. The truth. The truth. Sanctify them through thy truth. In other words, set them apart through thy truth. Thy word, he said, is truth. Pontius Pilate said, what is truth? Speaking as a relative philosopher. In other words, what's truth? Is there any absolute truth anywhere, Pilate said? What do you mean, truth? Is there anything such as truth, absolute? Why isn't everything just based on how I feel and my culture and where I happen to be at this time in life? No, 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 no. 
That book is absolute truth. It judges everybody's culture, philosophy, time and life. The book does. It's an amazing thing about the book. Hadn't a word of it been written in 2,000 years, and yet it talks to us today just like it's, that's, blow your mind, wouldn't it? Truth. I'm going to tell you something that I just found yesterday. I was digging around a little bit. I have to do a website, so I'm trying to learn as much as I can about what I have to do. So if I get into a mess, I can get out of it, because I can sure get in a mess. Every time you log on to a computer and watch a, a, a computer screen, you're looking at a, a web browser is browsing the internet. You may be using, uh, you may be using Internet Explorer, you may be using uh, Opera, you may be using Firefox, you may be using Internet uh, uh, Safari, the Apple program. Uh, uh, Google's got Chrome, and there may be some more out there. They read that page that's an HTML page, okay? Hypertext markup language page. Four has been the latest one until five has just come out. Now listen to what I'm telling you. Listen to what I'm telling you. Every time you look at the, open, we'll log on the computer and start looking at a web page, when five finally saturates the market, it has the capacity built in to tell where you are. Nobody had ever told me that. I didn't know that. I just got to digging around a little bit in it and it popped right out. And I thought to myself, my, my, my. HTML5. And you don't know what you're reading. You don't know if it's five or four or what you're reading when, you lo when you're reading a computer page. It has the capacity to know where you are. Now, why do they want to know where you are? You say, I don't know if that's so. I challenge you, go check it out. Go check it out. Just go to Google, type up HTML5. You'll, you might have to do a little bit of reading. And one of the new things added to it is the ability to detect where you are. Big Brother's ready, folks. Yeah. It's, they're not playing games. The Lord's coming back. That's the first thing crossed my mind when I read that. He's coming back. You're not listening. I know you go to church and everybody runs to the altar and you have prayer and this and that. But let me ask you a question. Are you ready for the coming of the Lord? Your computer now is going to start spying on you. And it's going to know where you are. Yes, sir. 